Okay, let's start on soft tissue injuries. The, the thing with this is it makes it very easy. A lot of definitions you look at, you look at the wound and say, okay, that's an abrasion, no, that's a laceration, who puncture wound, right? Across the board, all these definitions, the treatment is the same. So when you look at a soft tissue injury, you essentially bandage and splint it. Okay, if it needs to be splinted, then you bandage and splint. Now, don't forget all the other stuff. See, we don't leave out. We, we are making a presumption that you're doing your scene size up, your BSI, your good general first impression, your ABCs, you start in on your sample assessment, OPQRST, right? And now we get to the treatment phase. We're saying the treatment phase for this is high concentration oxygen, if needed. Right? Treat for shock, always treat for shock. Bandage and splint. Is everybody good with the treatment? That way we don't have to stop and say, oh yeah, you dry still dressing a thousand times. Most all your Soft tissue injuries, you place a dry 4x4, four 5x9, four, whatever size uh, bandage over the top of it, and then wrap it with clean. Okay? Everybody good? All right. When we look at the areas here, we have the skin, which involves soft tissue. You get into the fat. Some have more fat than others. Okay? So you can get into that fatty tissue and that can rip open. And then you get into the muscle and the vessels. And that's where this soft tissue injury, when they say soft tissue, that's what they're talking about. Skin, fat, and muscle. It doesn't get into the bone. Those are classified as musculoskeletal injuries. And that's much, that'll be in a few weeks, okay? So we're talking about skin, fat, and muscle as far as the injury is concerned. So, obviously, you look at a def the definition, a closed injury is one that doesn't break the integrity of the skin. So, the, the uh, integrity of the skin is not broken. So, you have this big bruise or this contusion here. Right? And then an open wound is where the integrity of the skin is broken. When we get into fractures, it's going to be the same. An open fracture is where the integrity of the skin is broken. A closed fracture is where the skin's not broken, right? So those two definitions are the same. Your like trauma, trauma's easy. It's just, it's just a lot of common sense. It's not like all these other medical things. We talked about abrasions. Abrasions is sort of a strawberry, and it gets that capillary bleeding. Let me hit these lights, because uh, the other one, so you can see the cool pictures coming up. So you have the abrasion here, and that's going to produce capillary bleeding. And then the other one here is the incision. An incision and a laceration are two different animals. We'll talk about that. That happens to be probably an incision. How they classify an incision is it's done by a surgical top instrument or something sharp like a surgical top instrument. Thin cut. Hmm? What? It's a thin cut. Yeah, thin, precise, like a real sharp knife would cause an incision. Uh, a jagged edge type knife or something would cause a laceration. Now, which one do you think bleeds the most? Laceration. Incision. incision. Why the incision? It goes in deep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just straight. It's not jagged. Because it's hard to clot. Huh? It's hard to clot. The incision? Yeah. That's the first thing. Well, I don't really know the answer. Uh, what is the <laughs> but uh, let me tell you why I think that the incision bleeds more. The, when you have an incision, the incision is going to bleed more because of the fact that I believe the body senses that as, as normal, more normal, uh, like an operation. Uh, plus, it is nice and clean and sharp, and it cuts straight through, right? A laceration causes a jagged cut. Now, when you when you cause the jagged cut in a laceration, it does more trauma to the vessels, 
And when the vessels are traumatized, they constrict. So they're going to bleed less. These vessels are not traumatized as much, so they're not going to constrict as much, so they're going to bleed more. Does that make sense? I made all that up, but I think it's right. So you get a selection here. You've got this nasty little abrasion on this guy's knee and down on his thigh. This is where you're going to get the capillary bleeding that we talked about, sort of that oozing type bleeding. All right? No big deal. No, don't need to treat this person for shock if this is the isolated injury. They're not going to go into shock over capillary bleeding. It does need to be placed on a dry, sterile dressing, though, just like any open wound, correct? You've got to cover it up. Remember the four life-saving steps, right? Start the breathing. Stop the bleeding. Protect the wound. Treat for shock. If you remember those four, you you got it made. Alright? So, ABCs, cover that up. Dry sterile dressing, don't worry. It's going to stick, but when they get to the hospital, they're going to wash it. They're going to wet it, and, and uh, we're going to peel off again. So there's a good sort of... Uh, these, are, these could be some lacerations down here at the bottom. This would be up here on the knee, would be the abrasion, and then you get some lacerations down there towards the bottom. The other wounds you have are puncture wounds and, and lacerations. See where it's more jagged over here on the side? They're trying to show you that these tendons here, I've got better pictures coming up, but the, uh, then you have a puncture wound. One thing with a puncture wound, whether it's a stab wound or a gunshot wound, you want to make sure that you inspect an entrance and an exit wound on both of these. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Just make sure that you look for an exit wound on, on the puncture type wound. The other thing is, like on a stabbing, on a puncture wound, uh, you want to try to find the knife or sword or whatever they stab with, and you sort of look at it, you, you pick the knife up, like if this ruler was the knife, I don't know why I was used to use you as an example for stabbing people, but it works. So if I was to stab you right, and I'd pull it out, I'd have the bloodline right here, because I'm not going to leave my sword uh, necessarily in you, so the I, I'd have a bloodline, so when you look there on the knife, you go, hmm. Well, that went in quite deep. So you could see where, what organs might be affected through the stab wound. In the same way with the gunshot wound. You sort of have to look at a gunshot wound as it goes through the body and imagine what kind of damage that it could cause as it went through. They could. They could. depends on the uh, the the round and the velocity of the round. Like if you had a like a nine millimeter, you know, got shot with your shot with a Glock or something, has a lot of punch to it. It depends on the round, on what the round's going to do. On a gunshot wound, if it's just a a regular bullet, a regular projectile. More than likely, it's just going to go through. It's going to make an entrance wound and an exit. Now, it could hit a bone and deflect off. So it could go, let's say, in the chest, hit the spine, and land up in the heart. It could uh, move around like that. The other one would be, it could go anywhere. Right? Now, on gunshot wounds, you have to look at for the exit wound because most people that... Uh, you know, like the police officers and, I don't know, personal protection or whatever, in their, in their weapons that they have, they have hollow points. Now, because it's, a, it's going to make a bigger impact, it's a bigger round, a hollow point is designed to cause uh, destruction. Because as it goes through, it opens up, and it, makes a, it will make a small entrance wound, but a, usually a very large exit wound. It's going to sort of open up and fan out and make a bigger projectile. It flattens out and makes the projectile bigger. 
as it passes through. So the big thing is, always look for an entrance and an exit wound. So you have two wounds, typically, on the gunshot, right? So look at that, but it's the same way. You cover both wounds and treat both wounds, right? And treat the patient for shock. The other thing that you have to look at as far as a gunshot wound is this. I'll try to draw something that doesn't... It's not nasty. <laughs> okay, this is the belly. Okay, so as the bullet comes through, that's the bullet. Okay, as it goes through and it enters the belly, what's going to happen is the round is going to go through like this, okay? But it's going to cause what's called a, a cavitation because that bullet is traveling so many feet per second. What is that creating? Velocity and... Energy. Energy. Creating a tremendous amount of energy. And we know that energy can't be what? Destroyed. Destroyed. Right. Energy, <laughs> energy can't be destroyed. So what's going to happen here is this round is going to go through, but it's going to cavitate, and the energy coming off of that round could cause ruptured organs, lacerated organs, it could cause damage, internal damage to the organs. Can you see that? How that would, how that would happen? If I hit this desk like that, that, that caused energy. If you had a device to measure that, you would, it could measure a certain amount of energy that that transpired. Cars do the same way. When a car hits head to head, head on, right? It's creating a tremendous amount of force and energy, and that energy is absorbed in your hood, right? In your car, and that energy goes around you. The car makers design these cars, so all that energy, let's say in a head on collision, goes around you instead of through you. The cars, each car, I found out unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Has the, and I knew they had crumple zones. So as you're driving down the road, you're looking over to the side, and you see this car all crumpled up. Uh, what's that thing called? We, accordion. Accordion, yeah. It's all crumpled up in the front, and you're thinking, man, that's a bad wreck. But that's what cars are designed to do. They have essentially three crumple zones, where they crumple up a little bit at first, and then they hit that second crumple zone. The third or fourth crumple zone breaks the motor mounts and the motor falls on the ground. Why, why is this? Because so the motor don't get, like, don't get on your legs and burn you. Right. So the motor doesn't enter into the... Yeah, exactly. So the motor doesn't enter into the uh, driver's compartment. It, it's going to fall on the ground before that. I've got some cool pictures of one. Uh, I'll show you later if you're interested. But... So you look at this, and you have to sort of estimate that that particular type of damage. When you look at that. So this would be more of a laceration or a little flap. See how it's jag jagged and torn there? Remember the treatment's all the same. You would just sort of fold that flap back over, bandage it, potentially splint it. Not a major wound right there unless you have a tendon involved. When you get to the hand, well, wait, I have a picture of a hand I want to show you. Oh, it's right here. Does that look like a pretty major wound? Yeah. Why? It's deep. It's deep, but what's this right here? Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably a tendon. That little white area is probably a tendon. And how they're going to assess the severity of this is they don't have the patient CMS, right? They don't have them move their fingers. If this patient can't move one of their, or two of their fingers, that means that that tendon was involved in that little cut. It's like severed that tendon, all right? So that changed the whole ballpark. 
that wound without a without the tendon involved is a, a minor wound. With that involved, that needs to go to a level one trauma center. And around here, it would go to Baylor downtown because that's where they, they do all the hands. So a minor wound, but it, it got the tendon, if it got the tendon, then it would be a more of a major injury. Still easy to fix, but make sure that you take it to the right place. Now this one on the other hand, what about that? Is that a pretty big wound? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a, not a huge wound. I mean, you look at it and go, yeah, that's a, that's a fairly large laceration. And I can't figure, never have been able to figure out what part of the body that is. But it's a fairly large laceration. See all the blood sort of coagulating in it? It kind of looks like right the back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now that that doesn't as long as there's not a problem in here. This is if this is isolated, that's not a huge injury, really. You don't get the a surgeon come in and look at that, probably an ER doc. They don't clean it out, and then they put internal sutures in there. They don't take all this stuff here and put internal sutures in it. And then they're just going to put external sutures. The internal sutures will dissolve. And then uh, they take out the external. So not a huge injury as long as it's just soft tissue. As long as you didn't get an organ, a kidney, or something like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now you look at this, like I was telling you before. You look at these type of injuries because we'll look at it you know, two dozen of them today that you probably won't see very often. I mean, that's a, something big caused that. Look like they, maybe a knife fight or something. They filleted them open. This is what we were talking about, the penetrating wounds. You know, you have this sort of smaller entrance wound and a, a bigger exit wound. No problem, you would just cover both wounds, treat the patient for shock. As we discussed, then the other ones that the definitions we're still in the definition phase. So the other one is an avulsion. Better picture that's coming up in a minute. But an avulsion is a tearing away of the tissue. So this means that this tissue got caught on something and just didn't cut it away; it tore it away. So there's going to be more damage done to the skin. See the little flaps and stuff? You would uh, not cut those flaps off, as tempting as it looks. You just lay, lay them back over onto the tissue and then bandage all that together. Not a huge injury, really. Probably going to leave a good, cool scar if the person is older. They will go through more... Uh, more work on a younger person. They don't want to leave a big scar on a younger person. Like I've seen them with pediatrics, I've seen them take small, I mean what I would consider a very small laceration to the face, and they send them to do into plastic surgery so they not have a scar there on their face. You know, an older person, they would say, you know, oh right, well, it'll be a good dinner conversation. You know, look at this scar, you know, that thing. On a younger person, they're they're not going. They're probably send them into plastic surgery, and and get that fixed. But again, on our end, bandage it, probably splint it, you know, do that. Mm. Amputations, amputations are not that big of a thing. Complete amputations. Again, they have to go to the level one trauma center, right? So you. You take the amputated part, or the, you, you want to find the amputated part, okay? But this one's just an open wound. So you take some dry steel dressing, dress that up, control the bleeding. On the amputated part, you take it and put it on something cool. You have to keep it cool. Make sure that you don't freeze it. What I recommend, what, what you do on the ambulance, is that you take the part like a, especially a finger, and you would place it around the chemical ice packs. 
Most people carry about a half dozen, most amateurs carry about a half dozen chemical ice packs. So you break a couple of chemical ice packs, put the finger in between them to keep it cool. If you don't have that and all you have is ice, you have to be very careful not to freeze the part. If you freeze the part, it's gone. It's done. They can't, they can't reattach it. And they do some really amazing reattachments now. You'd be surprised what they can reattach if the part is, is good. But if you freeze the part, you can't do it. So on here, you would take that, bandage the little stub, uh, find the finger, and, and keep, it, keep the fingers cool. Make sure that you transport them to a, a hospital that can do reattachments. The Metroplex, it's Baylor again. Baylor does all the hands and reattachments. And then there's sort of a bigger picture of that avulsion, so you can see a little bit better. You've got a lot of tissue here, but see the subcutaneous tissue, the, the yellowish looking stuff? That's the fat. So you just peel these, take these flaps and just roll them back up in there. They'll probably cut them off at the hospital, but we won't cut them off. And take that dry still dressing, control the bleeding. It won't be that much uh, at this body part here. They're probably more than likely have to have a skin graft. Probably take some skin off their back of their leg or their butt and put it on their arm. Or they're, you know, they're growing new skin now. So they might take some new skin cells and put on there. Just, just depends on where it's at. I think I'd rather have the scar. You know, that way I could, at dinner I could go, man, look at this scar. Then, you know, make up some big story what happened, you know. Yeah, I got attacked by a lion or a shark or, you know. It, it'd have to be a good story. Now, this particular injury here, what would you do to that? He's lost his thumb. I think this is where the thumb was. His middle finger. Never be able to give anybody the bird anymore. But, because uh, it's gone. This is a gunshot wound. It blew his hand off. So what do you do with that? Bandage it. You're going to have to splint it. There's some fractures in there. So bandage and splint it. Treat it for shock. No. No ice. So bandage that, splint it, same way that you would do for the other one, that the, the, the small avulsion that was over there in the forearm, right? This would be the same treatment. Now, he's going to lose a lot more blood here, correct? But uh, still, bandage and splint it, no, no problem, as long as you take it to the right facility. You show up at the wrong facility with this, and they're going to have a cow. You know, You've got to take these uh, big trauma things to the right place. And, of course, that would be a level one trauma center thing. Make sure good CMS, treat for shock. Probably won't be a great deal of blood loss, I'm guessing. Not, not to the hand like that, but there would be some. Because, you know, it doesn't incorporate, it didn't get down into the wrist. What would we be concerned about if it got into the wrist? Right, the radial artery right there, correct. Now this is a particular cool injury. It's, it's not as bad as it looks, really. It's, it's called a degloving injury. You can sort of see how they get the name, right? <laughs> it's that the, what happened is this, you can't see it right here, but this is a ring. This guy had a ring on, got caught on something, and it pulled his finger off pulled the soft tissue part of his finger off and uh, it left the bone. What they're going to do there is take that soft tissue, clean it up, slide it back on like a glove. That's why I call it a de-glove. They slide it back on. It's going to require some, you know, some microsurgery, vascular surgery to reattach all the peripheral nerves and everything, right? And all the vessels. But they're take that finger, 
and just slide it back on. Now you would treat that as a uh, amputated part. So you put the you bandage and splint the open wound here, and then take the the glove part of the finger, wrap it in a uh, sterile dressing, and then keep it cool, just like you would an amputated part. Again, take it to a level one because it involves the hands. So it would it would definitely have to go there. Questions there? Everybody good? So it's, you see the repetitiveness of this? Bandage and splint it. Bandage and splint it. This, this is the same way. You probably wouldn't ask the guy to bend his hand like we were talking about in a functional position. You'd keep that bone straight and just on a, on a small board. Just place it up like you were splinting an arm and on the small board. So to wrap it, you'd wrap the, uh, the finger independently with, with the sterile dressing, right? And then you just put it on a small board and splint it. Same way. Just put it on a small splint board. Yeah, wrap it up, bulk it up, put it on a small splint board. How would you ask him to move his fingers? Like, everyone, like... What? How would you ask him to move his fingers? Like, would you want to move the bone? I guess it'd be cool to see that bone move. <laughs> you can ask He'd still be able to move. Why would he be able to move that finger? Because it's the part of his... Right here. Yeah, the tendons are on the on the palm side here, so they'll be able to. He's still able to move his finger, so you should be able to get good CMS in there. If he can't move this uh, middle finger, then you just tell him to. You would just document that. He said like his nerves would be touched. Yeah. Would it hurt if he wiggled it? Oh yeah, there's still um, enough to be painful. This is why we wear shoes when we're mowing the lawn. Okay? You know, one of the things that you look at, especially where I live out in sort of a rural area, you probably don't get it this much here in, in the ski, but we have a lot of grandfathers, granddads, taking their little grandsons out on the lawn mowers. Everybody has a riding lawnmower. I mean, it takes forever to cut the grass to live in the country, right? I've done a hand by hand. It took three days. But, uh, so they let the little grandson ride around on the lawnmower. If, if Pops gets his butt up off of the seat, what happens to the lawnmower? It stops. If the grandson falls off the lawnmower, what happens? Keep going, yeah. So not a, not a safe thing. This, things where this takes place here, where you get these accidents, is where you do something that where the, the piece of equipment is not designed to do that. A lot of people, what will happen is, like a push mower here, or even a riding mower, they will stop and try to clear an obstruction without turning off the mower. I know it sounds stupid, but they're reached down there, especially with fingers, and try to remove stuff from the mower, like on a riding mower, so they don't have to get off. And their hand gets caught up underneath it. And they're still on the mower, so all the safety things are uh, engaged, or disengaged, right? So, what would you do here? Yeah, bandage and splint it. Bandage it up, find the toes, if you could. They may be over in the neighbor's yard by now, but... You know, or a bird may have flew by and picked one up. <laughs> this is just showing you the amputated part. This hand's completely severed. So you would take the hand itself, right? And keep the hand cool. Wrap up both ends, cover the wound. So you'd cover the wound on the extremity, on the arm, and then take the hand and cover the wound on the, on the uh, proximal part of the hand right here. Does that make sense? And then keep the hand nice and cool. You're going to get quite a bit of blood loss out of something like that. 
but the ones I've seen, you can still control with direct pressure. It's no problem. Does it hurt the patient? I imagine that hurt, yeah. Let me amputate your hand. Well, like, the direct pressure on the wound like that. Oh. Does that hurt them? No, not really. No, that, uh, that lose a lot of nerve. Those nerve endings are not really that exposed. So, uh, now, here's the thing. That's a good, actually a good point to make. Now, in amputation, like this one, would you request ALS or what? Could you take that to bait? Let's say you were in Sunnyvale and they have a dual EMT and you get an amputated hand. Can you take that to Baylor? If they're hemodynamically stable or their blood pressure stable, would would it be a BLS thing to take that to Baylor? Or would you rather have ALS? Why ALS? Yeah, you can help them treat them for shock a little bit, fluids medicine. You can give them pain medicine, right? So that would be one thing. If the patient wasn't in any, any type of acute distress, pain, then a BLS would be okay. I mean, I wouldn't BLS it, but that would be okay to do that. Minimum blood loss, blood pressure is okay. You know, vital signs, not tachycardic. So, not too bad. And they have several hours. Whoops. I don't know how many hours they have. It's, it's three or four hours, I think, to reattach a, an extremity. So, it's, uh, they have some time. This one, on the other hand, what's... I'll show you this, because this is like catastrophic type of... When you got this amputated leg, right... This guy looks like he got run over by a train. He's got this big, huge amputated leg right here. This one, what, what's up with that? That's just all mushy, right? I think it's turned around. Huh? It looks like it's turned around. The foot? Yeah. yeah, it's off. They just laid the foot up there for the picture. You know? What if this here, you would treat that like an amputation, right? You'd go ahead, his left leg... You go ahead and uh, wrap that up as best as you could. It'd be a little harder to keep the lower extremity uh, cool, but you would still do that, right? So you look at that. This would be treat splint it if this guy's with the living, which obviously he's in the hospital. So splint that. That would create quite a bit of uh, banishing, correct? And then cool the amputated part. This looks all just mushy and mangled. That's going to be more of a problem, right? I mean, because you have just stuff there. You have meat and, and tendons. and it, it doesn't even look like it's all there. So how would you go about that? How would you bandage that? Yeah, the same way. I mean, you just have to sort of look at it and sort of put a splint underneath it and try to try to wrap it around as best as you could. You know, uh, in, in short, you would take that and you would push all that tissue together. It's just like hamburger. Okay, let's say you have a pound of hamburger out here that's laid out on the table. And you want to package that hamburger. This might be a good drill. It not waste so much hamburger. You take it, try to splint that hamburger on the splint board. So you have a pound of hamburger meat that's sort of fragmented out. And you've got to bandage it up and wrap it up to put it all on a splint. And that, I think that's the way that you, you're, you would have to look at that mentally. So I'm just going to sort of wrap all the pieces and parts up as best I could and use a whole lot of clean to keep it all together. Huh? Yeah, it's probably not... They're not gonna, I don't think they're going to salvage this. They're, if this guy's still alive, they're probably going to have... A, he's going to be a, a, a bilateral amputee. 
I don't think they can fix this. I've seen a lot of blowout fractures, and that's sort of similar to what that is. Uh, they're just very hard to fix because there's not any tissue left there. This, I don't know. That's going to be difficult too as well. So he may lose both. More, more than likely, this guy's going to lose both of his legs. All right. Question so far? So a lot of the same thing, correct? A lot of the same type of injuries. Then you get into uh, crushing injuries, crushing injuries to the chest that create multiple rib fractures. It's very difficult to fracture the ribs because the way that they're rounded. So it takes a tremendous amount of energy to fracture the ribs, uh, especially like this where you get multiple ribs sort of fractured out. But primarily, the, the injuries themselves are tr uh, treated the same way. So like this is a crushing type degloving injury all together. Because so, you can see the hand that's crushed, correct? And it's degloved. But the good thing is that the treatment is still the same. Split it back, bandage it up. Okay, and then transport it somewhere that can do the hands. Would you take the leg skin off to keep it clean? No, no, just that's a good point. When you when you bandage and splint, you you leave everything in place unless it's on fire. Then you would take try to take it off; it's on fire or put it out. We'll look at that in front, at, with the burns. Would you still like separately keep it cool? No, no, you wouldn't have to do that. You just, if it's not completely off, you just leave it home. There's probably vessels attached still. It's probably still attached. So you would leave everything in place and splint that. You wouldn't go ahead and take the, the degloving part off. Now, if this was completely off, you would, again, you, then you'd keep this part cool if it was amputated. A lot of times, splinting takes a lot of imagination. So you look at the injury and you go, wow, how am I going to splint that? Like that one guy before, you know. So you go back to here and you walk up on that on scene and you, it's going to take a minute to think and you're going to go, how am I going to splint that? How am I going to take care of that? All right. So your imagination is going to have to kick in and thinking about how you're going to fix it. And sometimes there's not enough there to splint. So you have to cover it up as best as possible and then just transport them to the hospital. Now here at ALS, definitely. You ran up on that as a BLS call, you're like, oh, call ALS. You know, they need ALS intercept for the EMT. Neck injuries can be quite serious because of what, what's in the neck? The carotid arteries? What's in the mid? The trachea? Right? You lacerate the trachea, where does the air go? Yeah, you can't breathe anymore. You've created, you've lost your uh, uh, ability to breathe. Plus, you can get very large... Uh, air embolisms because that air is going to go to where? The, the path of least resistance, right? The least amount of pressure. So that air can enter the vessels because of the difference in the pressure. Gas, remember gas will always move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So you can get air embolisms there. This guy is not with the living because what, you see the OPA and everything, but they, it transected his trachea, right, into his neck. Probably got his uh, carotid. But if you ran up on that, and you go, let's say this guy was still breathing, gasping for air. Uh, how would you fix that? I mean, you, you come up, the guy's laying on the ground, 
You do your size up, everything, you see that? So, oh, that's a airway problem, huh? This trachea is cut in two. How are you going to fix that? You need to breathe for them, right? Stick what to? Like, 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 put it right there, like put the mask there. Would that work? Mm -mm. You won't be able to get a seal. Let me tell you what AL, the, like a paramedic unit would do, or ALS unit would do. They'd walk up on that and they'd stick an endotracheal tube through his neck right here. They'd grab hold of his tra trachea, they'd put an endotracheal tube in there and breathe for him if he was still alive. But you guys can't do that, right? That's an ALS skill. So what would you do as an EMT? Call ALS. Definitely call ALS. But how are you going to keep this guy alive between the time that you get there and the time that an ALS unit gets there? Control the bleeding. But what about A? He's not breathing. He can't breathe on his own. His trachea gets cut in two. No, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't really do anything. You're right. You're you're out of luck. You know, we'll look at some different type of airways later, towards the end of the class. That if you're able to use this, that you could put in there like an endotracheal tube. Otherwise, you're not going to get a good seal ventilating this guy. And uh, it would just be very difficult. Now, what do you do if you have an injury like this? Let me make sure there's not a better picture coming up. No. So, what do you do if you have an injury like this, but you didn't, it didn't involve the trachea? So, you just got this big gaping gash to this guy's neck. Bandage, I, bandage it with what? Sterile. Yeah, sterile dressing, got that, but... What would you use? Tape. But you can't wrap it back. Yeah. Like, cover it? Yeah, what would you use to cover it with? Huh? A like a C collar? Yeah. Yeah, but you're, you're getting there. What are you going to use before that? <coughs> Gauze. And if you would, you have what's called a 5 by 9 pad. They're on every ambulance in the state of Texas. It's called an abdominal dressing, or it's a five by nine. It's a huge uh, pad. I'll break one out during the break. We'll look at it. But you would take that huge abdominal dressing, put that over the guy's neck, right? And then, like you're saying, you take a C collar and you crank that C collar down as tight as you could, because the C collars don't provide you direct pressure. So you take a big bulky dressing over his neck. And then a C collar as as tight as you could get it. Would that cut off his No, well, you wouldn't put it that that tight, but you, short of cutting, choking him out, you would put it as tight as you could around the neck. Yes. I don't know. We had one guy that uh, was carrying a mirror, and he tripped, and he tripped, dropped the mirror, fell over the mirror, and it cut his neck very similar to that. Ooh, and when they got there, he was holding his hands over his neck like this and blood was just pouring out. Yeah. And they did the same thing. They took a, a big abdominal dressing, wrapped its neck, and then wrapped it around with a very small C collar to hold direct pressure on there. And then got up to a level one trauma center. Most of these neck injuries are going to be fatal when you get in there. I've seen, heard some guys say we're running through the bottoms of the, this river, uh, pushing drugs, and they didn't realize they got out, sort of out of the river onto this farmer's land, and he had bob wire stretched across his part of the river, and they were on jet skis and they were running drugs. They didn't see the bob wire, and it caught them right there at the net. Sort of filleted their head back, but. Yeah, it's. Like I say, most of the time they're going to be fatal. So we know we're going to expose the wound. We're going to uh, necessarily get stuff away from it. 
We don't put a dry, sterile dressing over it, control the bleeding, and then treat for shock. The good thing about it is, remember that they're, they're, the treatment is all sort of the same when, when we get in there. All right. Very easy to maintain. So shock, keep them warm, elevate high concentration of oxygen. And we talked about the avulsions and amputations already. Keep them cool, put the flaps back in. Uh, don't freeze the the part. That's very important. What about these eye injuries? Flushing the eye is quite quite a deal. You get something in your eye. Has anybody ever had anything stuck in their eye? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Did it have to permanently stay there, or could it come out? No, just something that's there, turf. I've had a I've hit a nail before, even with glasses. It's part of the nail, the metal embedded itself in my eye. What? And had to go to the doc. I couldn't get it out. I tried flushing it and doing all that. And uh, the thing with these eye injuries, and of course you flush it away from the good eye, right? And uh, but if you this is painful within itself. Most of the time, with especially little kids, you can't get their eyes open. Once they shut their eyes, those five muscles or so that holds that eye in and does that, they're short and they're very strong. So you need the jaws of life to pry their eyes open to flush them. It's very difficult. So I would recommend with an eye injury, obviously a level one injury, but also ALS because we carry what's called tetracaine. It's just eye drops that numb the eye. So we put an eye, a couple drops of tetracaine in there and it numbs the eye, then they can't feel it, so the flushing doesn't hurt as bad. When you get something in your eye, why do you like automatically close it? Like, what makes you do that? Just to protect you, like a blank. Blank, right? Blank, 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 blank. <laughs> Stop, you're getting really close. Oh, oh. So, anyway, with any eye injury, flush it, flush it. Till you make sure that absolutely the the object is out. If you can't get the object out, keep trying to flush it as flushing as possible. If not, when you go to bandage the eye, make sure that you bandage both eyes. So you take that because, and you put the bandage on both eyes because the eyes move together. So you wouldn't want to bandage one eye because if I had one eye bandaged and I looked over there, the other eye would follow it. So you bandage both eyes, which is going to make the patient blind, right? So the uh, you got to be leery of that when you're moving the patient around. You have to tell them, hey, we're, you don't feel a couple bumps, or hey, we don't move you over to the bed. Just don't, you know, they're sitting there, and all of a sudden jerk them over to the bed. I've done it. It's, it scares the patients to death. I forget, forgot the guy was blind. And... Uh, I didn't tell them we were moving. This patient over, so I grabbed the sheet and we pulled the patient over to the from Marcot to the bed. And he, he looked like a cat that just got stepped on. You know, he's like, uh, "What happened?" Because he can't see what's taking place. All of a sudden, he just realized he moved and dropped a little bit. And it felt like he was dropping to the, ground. to the ground. He couldn't see. So make sure that when you cover both of these eyes, that you tell the patient, "Hey, we're about to move you." Chemical burns, uh, objects to the eyes, uh, light burns, all the same. Flush it out, bandage both eyes. All right. Any questions there before we go into a different topic?